nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right, so now you guys know how to create tools, build them, test them, all ready to go. The next section, I want to show you how to upload those tools onto NanoHub and actually publish them so other people can use them. So think of it like your tool is sliding into the hub. But first of all, let me back up because a lot of people say, hey, I can already do this. There's things out there, there's SourceForge, there's GitHub, I can already put my code out there for people, right? Um, the trouble with that, though, is that if you put up some source code for people and you say, well, just compile it, then you, you get email like this um, from people that are trying to build and compile your tool. They'll say, well, I'm running on Windows, I'm running on Ubuntu Linux, and they'll throw all this stuff at you. Why didn't it work? And hey, I can't, can't get it to work. So you say, okay, that's fine. I'm going to put up pre-compiled binaries, right? Well, the trouble with that is you got to put them up for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and maybe different flavors of Linux. People, you'll build 32, but people will ask for 64. So you got to handle all the different combinations uh, for all the pre-compiled binaries, and you have to do that every single time you change your tool, right? And you'll still get questions from people saying, hey, it doesn't work on my machine, and you'll find some esoteric problem with their machine, and then you'll fix your code and put up new binaries, but then they have to go and find the new binaries and reinstall. And then you get people reporting bugs, and you're like, my gosh, I fixed that three releases ago, but you haven't updated your installation yet. And so people have to reinstall. And so the whole business of distributing software is, is really problematic uh, because of the source code and be, even with the binaries. Um, it's a lot of work. All right, instead of all that, if you put your tool up on NanoHub, number one, people can find it, but number two, they'll be able to run it really, really easily. So when you have a tool that's published on NanoHub, people searching, searching the web, searching on NanoHub, searching Google, might stumble across this page. This is a tool that I worked on called CNT Bands. And you can see the authors, and you can see what the tool is about. And if you click on the button to launch the tool right there, then it brings up this live tool session with the tool running inside of it. Um, no work for the person who clicked the button, it just works for them. And also, I can put up a new version tomorrow and whoever's out there will always get the latest version because when they click the button, they get the latest version of the tool that's installed. So it becomes really easy then to change the tools because you can change everything on the server and then everybody else just gets the freshest version of the code out there. All right, the other thing that's really interesting and important about this is you can build up your own story. So if you become an author and you publish a tool on NanoHub, NanoHub will collect statistics about who's using the tool. And if you go to your profile page on NanoHub, by the way, you guys can fill out your bio, you can upload a picture, make it look all nice. Um, and then when people come to your bio page and take a look, they'll be able to click on the, the button and bring up usage statistics. And not, you can look at this information, you can put it on your resume, other people can look at their information too and see, see what's there. Um, I, I grabbed this a while ago in 2010, uh, but at the time I had 21 contributions on NanoHub and there were 10,000 people that had used one or more of those tools, right? So I can write, write it down on my resume that I had 10,000 people using the simulation tools that I put on NanoHub. And more importantly, I can put that on my NSF grant application so that when NSF is trying to figure out who to give money to, I say, ooh, over here, 10,000 users, over here, right? I deserve the money, give it to me. Professors like that. You can also keep track of uh, rank by contributions. So out of 806 contributors on NanoHub, I'm number 24. Mm. Uh, I wish there was like badges and stuff I could earn too, but anyway, someday. Um, so you get all these statistics and you can follow. Um, the other thing that professors really like are the citations. NanoHub in particular does a really good job of tracking down all the papers that cite a particular tool. Uh, they have grad students, they have an army, small army of grad students that read all these papers and figure out like who's using what tool and then they keep track of it. So I've got 62 citations now on these 21 contributions in academic literature. And again, that's a really great thing because I can, I can brag about that, put that on my, on my Vita and put it in my proposals. Uh, so it gives me an impact story. Professors love that because they live and die by citations. That's like their whole, you get promoted, you get tenure, you get all that stuff based on citations. So if you guys are thinking about grad school, remember, citations.
All right, so by now, I hope you're convinced. All right, Nano Hub's a little bit better maybe than GitHub or something. So how do we get the tool uploaded onto Nano Hub? Well, first of all, if you go to Nano Hub on the front page, there's a resources menu that says, I think nowadays it says upload. So you can click on that link for upload and it'll get the process started. I'll just walk you through it and show you what it looks like, but maybe later this summer you guys might actually have a tool that you've created and you'll, you'll do exactly this. All right, so if you click the upload link, it takes you to a page that talks a little bit about how to do this and questions and shows you the kinds of things you can upload. And there's a button right there, black button that says get started. So if you click on that button, it will take you to a page and it will ask you what it is you're trying to upload. There are actually a lot of different categories of materials on NanoHub, and it's not just tools. You might have an animation that you've generated. Um, you might have a seminar or some notes or PowerPoint slides or a homework assignment, teaching materials, stuff like that. So all of those things, any of those things, you can upload and publish on NanoHub. But for right now, at the bottom of the list, it says tools. I'm going to show you the tools route. So you click on tools right there, and it'll bring up a form that says, uh, the form says things like, uh, ask me for, you know, what's the name of the tool, what's the version, all that kind of thing. So, I type in a short name. The first thing for the tool name it's asking for is a real short name. This will become like part of the URL. So it's all lower, you know, all letters and numbers, no spaces. So if your, to if your tool is something like quantum.lab, then you might call it qdot. Um, or Spirograph, you could call it Spirograph or Spyro or something like that, right? So a real short name. The next field will ask you for the tool title, which is like the full name. If you want to say Advanced Spirograph Lab there, you can type that whole thing out, right? Super Ultra Spirograph 1.0, uh, something like that. So you fill out a nice title. You can actually put in separate version information. Usually it starts at 1.0, and as you publish new versions, it's up to you. Um, but you may start a tool, and you say, I'm already at 5.0, baby. I've just never published any of the, the other versions of my tool. So, uh, so you can set that to whatever you want. It can even be weird stuff, like 1.0.1 alpha-1759, whatever. Whatever your numbering convention is, you put that up. There's a Next one is a one-line description of what your tool is. So if it's the spirograph lab, then you can say draws spirographs based on various input parameters or something like that. If it's a carbon nanotube simulator, you can say simulates the electronic density of states for carbon nanotubes. Something like that. One, one sentence, quick description. Um, there's a few boxes at the bottom that kind of set permission levels. There's one that says who's allowed to access this tool. And typically, uh, the answer is anyone can access the tool. But, for example, if, you're, if your simulator is like a, a quantum code encryption breaking algorithm, then you may say, well, we don't want other people around the world to access it. You might say, only people in this private group, restricted group, can access it. Uh, or you might say, well, anyone can access it, but not people in China. Or anyone in the U.S. can access it, things like that. So under that, who can access? Usually it's the whole world, but there might be reasons why you want to limit the access of the tool. There's also a, a item for source code access. Who's allowed to access the source code for your tool? Ah, now that's interesting. If, if you're kind of a free spirit hippie person like Richard Stallman, then you'd say anyone can access the source code for my tool because it's open source, right? And you can even choose an open source license and you can publish open source on NanoHub. Um, and that's great, actually. I love open source. Uh, but you may decide that you actually don't want to publish open source or that you can't or that maybe you're, after you get your tool published on NanoHub, you want to start up a company and you want to sell your tool so you don't want to put out open source. Um, so again, there might be reasons why you don't want to publish open source. And the great thing about NanoHub is that people can run your tool without actually looking at the source code, right? Because they can click the button and run it. So you decide here whether you want to have the, open, uh, the access to the source code be open source or closed source. Either way. Um, and you can change your mind later before the tool gets published, too. The next one asks for the project area. We're going to create a project area, you'll see in a minute, where you can work with the code and you can work with 
other people on your team. And the question is, who's allowed to access that project area? You might say, well, only people on the team can access it. Or you might be able to say, oh, who, whole world can access it. Uh, the Rapture project, for example, that we've been looking at all along in this course, that's an open project that anyone can access. Of course, only people on the Rapture team can edit the project, but everybody else can view it, right? Because you guys look at all the documentation and everything there. So you decide whether you want your project to be open or closed. And then at the very last thing on this form is who you want on the development team. So uh, right now, it will start off with just you, just your name on the list. But if you want to add people now or even later, you can just put their NanoHub logins. So you just ask your friend, hey, what's your NanoHub login? And then you add that onto the list there. And whoever you put there will have access to the source code and the private projects and all the private stuff. Uh, but they'll have access, for example, to the source code. They'll be able to check it out and make changes and check them in. So the development team are the people that are authorized to work on the tool. All right, so we fill out all that stuff. And then we click the button at the bottom to register the tool. And at that point, it becomes a little bit of a ping pong match. Um, you know, with some things, you can upload them onto a website and you're done. But with tools, it's a little more complicated because you got to make sure the tools are tested and installed and there's all this stuff that happens. So we start out at the very beginning. We just filled out that contribution form. And as soon as we do that, your tool goes into a state where it becomes registered. The people on the hub know about it. And it's their job to create a project area and set that up for you so that your team members can get into it. I think in the olden days, that used to be like a day or two turnaround. I think right now, it's like five seconds. We automated that part. So as soon as you submit your tool request, it'll very briefly be registered. And then immediately, the project area will be created for you, for your tool. And it will go into the created state over there. So in the blink of an eye, your project will be created. That's great. All right, now it's up to you to do some stuff. You have to get into your project, and you have to uh, start editing the documentation, check in your source code, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can get into a workspace and start building your tool, working on it. And when you get to a point where your, your code is working, you think it's ready, you can check it into the Subversion repository, commit it, and then click the button, and your code will become uploaded and move on to the next stage. Let me show you a little bit about how all that's done. Um, so once you're in this created stage where your project has been created, there'll be a special place on NanoHub where you can go and th there it has all this project management stuff in it. Um, there's a wiki area that you're seeing here for project notes and a bunch of other things that you see across the top. Um, there's a link for the wiki, for the source code, and all kinds of stuff along the top. And by the way, you can only see that stuff or really use it if you're in the project, um, if your project is closed and you have to be a team member and all that kind of thing, then there's a little login button. You have to log in. Unfortunately, even if you're already logged into NanoHub and then you go to this project area, you have to log in again. Just has to do with the way that we uh, implemented this. We didn't bridge the logins. But anyway, if you get to a page like this and it tells you, ooh, forbidden, or if you get to this page and you can't seem to edit anything, it's probably because you're not logged in. So just go to the login button at the top and use your NanoHub login name and password, or whatever your hub is, login name and password, and then it'll let you in. No problem. All right. Now, once you're logged in, you should see some controls at the bottom of every wiki page. Um, you'll see buttons for edit this page, attach file, delete this version, delete page, things like that. So these buttons down here, if you click on them, it'll bring up a little text editor where you can change the page using kind of a wiki syntax. You guys ever use Wikipedia? You ever do anything on Wikipedia? This is the same thing, basically. Um, it's a wiki page where you, it's, it's simpler than HTML. It looks like this. And I'll walk you through an example and show you what it looks like. It almost looks like English, except you put in just a few weird characters, stars and equals and things like that, that helps you kind of with the formatting. It's like HTML, except simpler. Um, and it's really nice because in just a few minutes, you can very easily write a page and change things. It's really terrific. So let me show you step by step. I've got wiki syntax over here, and I've got the web page over there. And you can see what it looks like. First of all, if you want to make a heading on your wiki page, you put equal signs around something on a line. So when I say equals CNT bands v2.0 equals, that makes the heading on the page. 
If I use two equal signs, equal equal overview, equal equal, that's like a subheading. And you can use three equal signs and so forth. So it kind of makes subheadings that way. If there's a word that you want to be bold, you can put three apostrophes around it. Tick, tick, tick. So that'll make that word bold. If you want to add a bullet, you just use space, star, and space. So space, star, space makes a bullet item on the page, bulleted list. And if you indent that, space, space, star, space, or something, add some more spaces, it indents the bullets. So it's smart enough to do that too. Um, if you want to make something italic, you can put two ticks around it. Three ticks is bold, two ticks is italic. You can put in links too. Just use square bracket around the link. If you just use square bracket around the link, it'll show the link itself. If you use square bracket, the link, and then some text, it'll, it'll use the text. Here it says nanohub, but it's linked to www.nanohub.org. Um, so you can, that's how you put links in. It's a square bracket and a web link and then some optional text if you want at the end. That's how you do a web. And then this little thing, the curly, 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 lets you put in predefined text. So if you're trying to tell someone, type this at your Unix command prompt, if you do curly, 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 everything you type is like left alone, preformatted. Um, so all of those special characters don't have any meaning anymore. It draws exactly what you, what you wrote over there. And it puts a nice box around it too, which I like. All right, so that's the basic idea. And there's also a, a wiki page about wiki page formatting. So if you go to the wiki, there's a page called wiki formatting in every project that gives you all the rules about formatting. And there's also wiki macros and there's all kinds of stuff in the wiki, a lot of stuff. If you're used to doing Wikipedia, this is very, very similar and familiar. Uh, very similar syntax. I don't think it's exactly the same, but it's roughly what you would do on, on Wikipedia if you were editing their pages. All right. One other thing too, if you wanted to create more pages, that's, a, that's how you edit the first page on your project. But if you want to create new pages in the project, one way to do that is just to put a word in there with a kind of the, the, they call it camel case, you know, uppercase letter and some lowercase stuff and uppercase again and some lowercase. If you do that, like new page with a capital N and a capital P, if you do that, the wiki automatically recognizes those words as if they were web pages. And you can click on it and go and it'll create a new web page for you. Um, I, I, I think I hate that. I think I hate that. Um, because usually I, I can never think of a web page that has like two capitals in it. And also whenever I type my name, right, McLennan with a capital M and a capital L, it always makes a wiki page out of it. Um, I should probably actually create that page someday and say, I hate this wiki syntax. When people click on McLennan, that's what it should say. Cause, uh, yeah, I don't, that's not my favorite part of the wiki. Um, Anyway, if you do that, if you stick new page in, it'll, at first it'll look weird like that. It'll look like new page with a question mark. And usually at that point I'm like, no, it's McLennan, not a wiki page, right? There's a way to do that too. But um, anyway, if it, if you say, it says new page, if you just click on that, like that, it'll actually bring up the, a new wiki page called new page. And I can click edit this page and fill it in. If I don't, it, it leaves it alone. It still doesn't, you know, didn't create a page. But if I click on a link and I click edit this page, I can fill it in and make a new page. So that's one way of creating a new wiki page. Um, uh, another way, an equally good way, is just to go uh, to wiki slash Fred, Foo, Wilma, whatever, and just start creating a page. And that'll create the page. It just won't be linked anywhere um, uh, unless you put a link specifically somewhere. So either way, you can create new pages on the wiki. Um, all right. Now suppose you did all that. And boy, you know, I've been working on this project for a while and you might, you're, you're, maybe your advisor is like, what's going on with the project? What's going on? You're like, well, I don't know. My teammates are probably screwing up. Always remember that should be your response when you're talking to your advisor. It's probably my teammates. They're screwing up. Um, but you can prove it to yourself by going to your MyHub page and checking out your project. So on your MyHub page, somewhere on your MyHub page, by the way, you can personalize the layout of your MyHub page, so I'm never sure where it's going to be on somebody's page. But you can find a module that says My Contributions, and it'll show all the different projects that you've created. So if you've registered a tool, I registered a tool called BioSensor Lab. If you've registered a tool called Spyro, you'll see an entry there for Spyro. 
Um, and what you can do is click on that, that link right there, click on that, and that will take you to a page that tells you what's going on with that project. It'll tell you what state it's in. You'll see all the information over on the left that you entered when you first created the project. You'll see all the people that are on the development team. You'll be able to click and change that and edit, you know, add new people onto the team. Um, and there's a section over on the right that will say what's going on. And in this particular case, when I look at this tool, it says, we are waiting for you. It says, once your source code's uploaded, let us know. So once you've got your tool all built and compiled, you know, compiled and tested it on a workspace and all that, and you've checked it in into Subversion, we'll talk about that in a little bit, then you go ahead and you click on the link that says my code has been uploaded. That's how you tell NanoHub, hey, as far as I'm concerned, my tool is ready. It's your problem now. So then the NanoHub guys will get it staged and ready for you. There's also a link here that says make a page that describes your tool. If you click on that link, it will take you in and ask you about information about your tool. This is the tool, this is the page that we first saw at the very beginning that describes the tool. It has the title of the tool, authors, abstract, all that stuff, right? So when you say create that page, it'll start asking you for various things on the page. Uh, it'll kind of walk you through and say, all right, who are the, what's the title of this? What's the abstract? Fill that, all that in. I think it uses wiki syntax um, for the abstract and all of that, so that's good. Uh, and then it you, you walks you through next, you can attach screenshots, next, you can say who the authors are, next, you kind of walk all the way through, it's like buying something on, on a website, it kind of walks you through page by page. And when you get to the very end, it'll show you kind of a mock-up of, all right, when you do publish this tool, this is what it's going to look like. These are the authors that are going to be credited, and this is, you know, the abstract and all that. It may turn out that when you're putting a tool up, your advisor may not be on the project team. He may not be able to get in and look at the code, but you probably want to list him on the authors because, you know, out of respect for the great professor, usually the uh, great professor is listed at the very end because he did the least to help everybody out. Um, so make sure you put your, your professor up on the authors. All right. Now back to this page, this page I showed you before that says we are waiting for you or whatever. There's also an edit button on there. If you click on that edit button, it lets you, it takes you right back to this page that looks like the original page when you started all of this, the, the page that re you registered your tool with. And it lets you change all that information. If you suddenly change your, your mind, you're like, you know, your professor says, no, I don't want that code to be open source. You're like, I gotta fix that. Uh, then just go back and click on edit and it'll bring that page up and you can change everything. You can say closed source or you can say, you know, export controlled or whatever else you want to change on that page. Um, a very common thing that happens is after you create the project, someone else says, ooh, I want to help you. And then you have to add them to the development team. So, after, you know, I might go back here and edit the development team. It's got my login listed and I can add my friend on as well. So you just put, you know, comma, login, comma, login, comma, login. You just need to know the login of whoever you're adding on. So you got to ask your friend, send them email or whatever, ask them what their login is, and then you can add that on. All right. And you can change things, like I said before, um, the, uh, whether you want to make something open source or restricted to the development team or whatever. All right, now, what if you did want to make something open source? A lot of people are kind of freaked out by open source. And, and that's the biggest problem we have on NanoHub. Seems like nobody wants to make their code open source because they think they're breaking a rule if they do that. Um, but you're actually not. It's, it's a good thing. The best thing about putting your code out as open source is you'll find your, it's for your future self. You'll find yourself a few years from now, not at Purdue, not working with the major professor, saying, dang, I wish I had that code. And if your code is out as open source, then when you're at a new school with a new professor or you're out in the working world with a job, you'll be able to grab that project that you've forgotten about years ago that's still on NanoHub and the source code's all sitting right there, right? So when you put your code out as open source, you're kind of giving it to yourself, your future self, um, down the road. And it's easy to do. What you do is, in all the files of your source code, it's a good idea to put in a copyright statement so, for example, I've got my name there. It says copyright 2011 or 2012, whatever, Purdue University. And then usually you put in a statement that says, see the file license.terms for information about my license. So if you, put, if you put something like that in every file of your code, that's kind of asserting your copyright ownership. 
Um, and you write down whoever is the copyright owner. If it's work for Purdue, I guess you write Purdue University. If you'd write it on your own time, you'd put your name there. You are the copyright owner if you're sitting down and creating a new computer program on your own computer. That's yours. So you copyright your name on it. All right, so first of all, it's a good idea to tell everyone that it's copyright, that you own it, and that there's a license terms file. And second of all, you can grab a license from a place called opensource.org. If you go to opensource.org, those are the, that's a little um, organization of people that collect open source licenses. And you can go there, you can find the Berkeley license, the MIT license, the NCSA license, the uh, GNU uh, public license, all the different open source licenses that are out in the world. If they're valid licenses, you can find them at opensource.org. So you can look around and pick out your favorite one, whatever your religion is. Um, grab one and copy it into your source code in a file called license.terms. Actually, NanoHub helps you do this because when, on NanoHub, when you go to publish your tool, it'll ask you for the license. You'll be able to choose a few common licenses or copy-paste your own in. And NanoHub will actually copy the file and make it part of your distribution and all of that. So, uh, so if you're doing this on your own outside of NanoHub, this is what you do. But when you're doing it in NanoHub, NanoHub will help you add a license on to your file if you want to. So you put the license in along with your copyright disclaimers. And then you put it out on, you put your tarball up on GitHub or you put it out on NanoHub or whatever. Again, if NanoHub is helping you do this, NanoHub will automatically mark your tool as open source. It'll have a link to the license that you specified inside NanoHub and it'll have a download link where you can download the source code. So NanoHub helps you do all of this when you go through the publication process. All right, now we're at the point where our project's been created. I wrote some wiki notes. I've been messing with my code. Again, get into a workspace and mess with your code. Um, there's this thing called subversion that we'll talk about next that you use to kind of check out your code, make changes, and keep track of all the changes. So I'll explain that in a moment. But let's assume that I'm in the workspace and I'm doing all that. And then at some point, you'll be all ready. And we'll go back to that page where it says, my, you know, we are waiting for you. Let us know when your code's ready. And then you click on that link. My code has been uploaded. As soon as you click on that link, that's telling the NanoHub folks that you're done. As far as you're concerned, the tool is ready. And that moves your tool into an uploaded stage. And somebody on the NanoHub team will recognize that. And they'll say, all right, that tool's ready. They'll go ahead and stage it, compile it, get it all ready to go. Not in your directory, but they'll put it in a, a central place where everyone can access it. There's a directory called slash apps on NanoHub. Basically, they'll take your tool and put it in slash apps. And then everyone who's allowed to will be able to access that tool. Um, so once your co code's in the uploaded stage, the NanoHub folks work on it. They get it all installed and ready to go, and they'll flip it to the installed stage. And when you get back to your tool page, you'll see what's next. Oh, it looks different now. It says the latest code is installed and ready. And it tells you to test the code, and it tells you to look at the page that we created earlier describing the application. And so those are the two buttons there. Um, the black button, you click on, and it'll launch your tool in kind of a preview mode. Nobody can see it yet, but you can and your team can. You can launch the tool and test it, and it'll show you exactly what it's going to look like when it's finally published. You'll get a sense of it. And that'll let, let you test a few cases, maybe push the button, try a few things, and catch any errors. So as you're testing the tool, um, you may find out you'll bring up the tool just like that. You'll mess with the controls. You get a sense of what it's really going to look like. And it may be that something goes wrong, in which case, you can click the link. Uh, first of all, go into a workspace and fix your tool. M say, oops, I missed something. Make the change, commit the change, test it in the workspace, and then click that link. The link says, I've fixed my code. Please install the latest updates. That puts it back into an updated stage, and somebody in NanoHub again recognizes, you know, there's a siren that goes off. New tool. It's not quite like that. But anyway, um, they recognize uh, some, something's changed. And then they recompile your tool, put it back in slash apps as a new version. And then they'll push the button and put it back into the installed stage for you. And that way, you can test it again. So now you click on the black button and you run it. 
Um, oh yeah, sometimes, very often at this point, people start having questions. Because let's say the tool's broken and you honestly don't know how to fix it. So there may be something out of your control or you may just be confused. You may run into a problem where you need some help. And a lot of times people will want to send email to somebody at NanoHub. It's, trying, it's like sending, I don't know, it's like trying to get uh, somebody from Google on the phone to solve your problem. Forget it, right? Don't do that. Um, it's, it's really bad to send email because who are you sending it to and it's all confusing and what if that guy's on vacation or I don't know, whatever. Don't do that. Don't send email. Instead of that, there's an area on the screen. If you go back to that screen that talks about your tool, down at the bottom under developer tools, there's an area that says message. If you click on message, you can send a message that says, I need help fixing up my make file, something like that, and then click send message. When you do that, that does two things. Not only does it ping the right person to help you solve the problem, but it also adds it onto a thread, a history thread for the tool, so that if that person is out and someone else is helping with the problem, they can read through the history file and they can understand exactly what's going on. They can see all the past conversation and, you know, it kind of brings them up to speed quickly. It's like when you're dealing with customer service, you know, anybody should be able to help you with customer service. They just look at the record and they figure out, oh, this is what happened, right? So use this mechanism. Don't send email directly. Type your messages in here. Click send a message. And then somebody on the NanoHub team will follow up when they're talking with you. You'll actually be able to check it yourself, too. Because if, if, you're, you know, if you ever wanted to see, what did they say they told me six months ago? I forget. You can go onto the history link, and it'll bring up that whole history. You'll see all those messages back and forth between you and the team um, in case you want to check it. All right. So now I fix my tool. They help me fix my make file. Everything's all set up. It's in this installed stage. They're waiting for me. So I click launch tool and it brings up the tool and I run through the test cases and I like it. It looks good. As far as I'm concerned, it's done. The other thing it says right below that is review the page describing your tool. And again, you might want to show that to your advisor and make sure he's okay with it. But again, you look at that and you say, looks good. Authors are all listed. Abstract is good. Everything looks done, ready to go. So at that point, there's a link that says, my tool is working properly, I approve it. And when you click on that link, that's your way of signing off, saying this tool is ready to go. Every once in a while, we have an advisor that calls us up at NanoHub and says, hey, how did this tool get online? It's not supposed to be online yet. It's all broken and all this. Who approved it? Aha, see, then we can go back into history and we can see it was you, you're the one that approved it. So, uh, so make sure when you're clicking that approve button that you tested your tool and everything looks good and, you know, otherwise, uh, don't do that until you're ready to go. Make sure your advisor has seen it too and, and uh, everybody's on the same page. All right, now at that point, when your, when your tool is approved, no matter who does it, only one person on the team needs to approve and then the tool moves forward. Um, make sure when it's in the approved stage, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we make sure when your tool gets to the approved stage, we take one last look at it just to make sure everything looks like it's working properly. We run it ourselves because you wouldn't believe every once in a while we get to a tool that's been approved and it doesn't run. You bring it up and it just crashes right away. Or you, you click simulate with the default parameters. They don't work. So that happens. I hope it doesn't happen with you guys because you guys are far too smart for that. Um, but it happens. So. So we take one last look to make sure everything looks right, and then if everything looks right to us, and there's no like, I don't know, bad messages, pornography, graffiti, whatever, that looks horrible, um, then we go ahead and publish it. So as soon as someone from the Hub team checks it out and approves it, they click the last link, and now your tool's published. And once your tool is published, everyone in the world can see it or at least everyone who's allowed to see it. You may have said that, you know, my tool is uh, private to this group or export controlled or something like that. Um, so people might not see it. But, uh, but, you know, if it's a public, open, available tool, it typically shows up on the what's new list. Um, on the NanoHub front page, there's a list of new resources. And those things are happening all the time as people publish tools and uh, new things are coming along all the time. So your tool will automatically show up as soon as it's been approved. and and uh, published, and uh, it'll show up on that list, and then anyone will be able to find it and launch it. All right, now at that point, life doesn't stop. You remember we were talking about the regression tester. Uh, you may add some new physics, you may fix a bug. Things happen where you're working on your tool. And if you go back to your tool page, 
it'll tell you your tool is published, but you still have options. It, they'll give you a link that says, I've made changes, please install the latest updates. So if you find a bug and you fix it and you want to put a new version of the tool up, then you'll click on that link. And when you click on that link, it will send you back to an updated state, just like we were before. And the sirens will go off at NanoHub and somebody will figure out, oh, this tool needs to get freshened up. So they'll go ahead and reinstall your tool and it'll be in the installed stage again for you. And then at that point, you'll take a look at it, test it and approve it or fix it again, whatever you need to do. And once it's approved, then NanoHub will take one last look and publish it. So you can go through that process as much as you want. Um, I mean, typically people do it for major changes, uh, but I, we have seen tools that people will change, uh, maybe publish a dozen times over the course of a semester, maybe more. Um, so you can change the tool as needed. Um, you shouldn't, I mean, but you should always test thoroughly and probably not put out 80 million versions of the tool, but important versions, right, when you've fixed enough stuff. So, all right. So my message to you is, don't let the code gather dust in the drawer. That's me with my SQL program on the big, remember, magnetic tape? My advisor had that in his bottom drawer. He swears he had it there for years and years, waiting for somebody to send a $10 bill so he could make a copy of it. And nobody ever did that. So don't, don't you guys make the same mistake. If you have a code and you want people to know about it, you can upload it onto uh, NanoHub. You can upload your own tools, your own tutorials to go with the tools and get it all online and share it with the world. By the way, we talked a lot about Rapture. You don't have to use Rapture to create these tools. We have some people that use MATLAB or what have you, create a tool. If it runs inside a workspace, you can publish it on NanoHub. Your favorite GUI toolkit may be Python and Qt or MATLAB or whatever. If you can get it to run inside of a workspace, you can publish it on NanoHub as a tool. Uh, Rapture just turns out to be an easy way for most people uh, to do that, but feel free to use whatever works inside of a workspace. Um, all right, now here's your assignment. Here's what we're going to do. I wanted to give you guys a chance to mess around with um, all of the stuff inside the projects. So I've created a special project called Boot Camp that you can get into. Um, as if it were a tool, we're not actually going to publish the Boot Camp tool, but anyway, um, you guys can at least mess with the wiki. So if you go to nanohub.org slash tools slash bootcamp slash wiki, it should bring up a wiki page for you. And uh, it may tell you that you're unauthorized and you have to log in. I forget. I guess it's open, right? So nanohub.org slash tools slash bootcamp slash wiki, you'll see a page that looks like this. You notice there's no buttons at the bottom in terms of being able to edit the page, right? All I see is a wiki page. If I want to be able to edit the page, if I'm in this group, and by the way, anybody who has a NanoHub account, we've already added you onto this project, so you're already authorized um, to see this. Um, I have to make sure I log in, remember? When I click log in, it'll prompt me, of course it already knows me, but it'll prompt you for your NanoHub login and password. You can enter your NanoHub login and password, and it'll let you in um, a little bit further, in the sense you get more options up here, and you'll also see buttons down at the bottom, right? So if you log in, you should get buttons down at the bottom that say things like edit this page, attach a file, all of that.